Nick writing. I have you, Father, as we open the word now. We ask that you just come and speak to us, whatever it is that you're particularly wanting to share with us today, that we would be attentive and receptive to that, God. Um, bless this time. Amen. Amen. How big is your God? Uh, one of the many things I love to do is uh, on a clear night to go out and survey the heavens and you just get a wonderful picture of the skies and the multitude of stars and uh, I've been doing some research and there is a star by the name V.Y. Canis Majoris and it is so 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 big that you could fit, no kidding here, seven quadrillion Earths in it. I mean, you can't get your head around that, can you? And it's just, that is one of hundreds of billions times hundreds of billions of stars in our universe. Earth, which we're on, is in the Milky Way, which is one of hundreds of billions of galaxies in our universe. How big is your God? You may have heard of this, the, the idea of fine, the fine tuning of the universe, and that the, the universe is sort of geared to the flourishing of human life on Earth. And John O'Keefe, an astronomer at NASA, says this We are, by astronomical standards, a pampered, cosseted, cherished group of creatures. If the universe had not been made with the most exacting precision, we could never have come into existence. It is my view that these circumstances indicate the universe was created for man. Mm -hmm. I agree. Amen. If we come a little bit closer to home, a lightning bolt, it's between two and three centimetres wide, two and three miles long, but the heat of it can reach 30,000 degrees Celsius, mm -hmm. which is five times hotter than the surface of the sun. Mm -hmm. And we've had a few thunderstorms this past week, haven't we? And let's have a think about living creatures, particularly those that roam our oceans. According to the World Register of Marine Species, the total number of marine species known is about 240,000. But there are believed to be between <coughs> 1.4 and 1.6 million creatures in our oceans. God knows them all, He creates them all. How big is your God. And let's bring back to ourselves, humans, the, the crown of God's creation. I'm just going to uh, read uh, just a short parable which just highlights how the wonder of what God's created in us. So the human brain is heralded for its staggering complexity and processing capacity. Its hundred billion euro and several hundred trillion synaptic connections can process and exchange large amounts of information over a distributed network of brain tissue in a matter of milliseconds. Such massive parallel processing capacity permits our brains to analyse complex images in one tenth of a second, allowing us to visually experience the richness of our world. Likewise, the storage capacity of the human brain is nearly infinite. During our lifetime, our brain will amass 109 to 1,020 bits of information, which is, ready for it, more than 50,000 times the amount of text combined in the US Library of Congress, or more than five times the amount of the total printed material in the world. Isn't that astonishing? We need more faith to believe that there isn't a God, that there is a God. And so I provide just a brief tour of uh, creation. And this is an echo of what we see for the particular character in the Bible. Now put your hands up if what I've just shared with you has inspired your faith in God in some way. Good, that's the answer I was aiming for. Because that is what God was looking to do with Job. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to Job chapter 
38. It's, it's our, uh, Job is the latest book that we're going through in our walk through the Bible. Uh, a little bit of context on his situation. I'm sure you're familiar with it, so very briefly. Job is um, a righteous man. He becomes the innocent subject of, the, of a kind of like a cosmic way between God and Satan. Satan believes that Job is only worshipping fallen God because of the blessings that God is giving Job. And so Satan, Satan asks, um, gets permission from God to bring suffering in his life. Now initially, this involves the death of his seven sons and three daughters. And when this happens, Job still worships God. He says, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. And Satan again comes to God and says, oh, can I afflict him again? And God allows it. And at this point, he is afflicted with terrible sickness. And if I understand the this pushes Job to the edge. And then in the, 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 the chapters that follow the bulk of the book, um, we see uh, him liaising and hanging out with his friends. Now initially his three friends get it spot on. They sit with him, they weep with him, they don't say anything with him. It's the perfect response to a man suffering. But then they begin to offer an explanation for what's going on. Now some of the stuff that they were saying was good. There was some nuggets of wisdom and revelation in there. Absolutely. But broadly speaking, the they're insensitive, being a bit insensitive, and they're not grasping what God is actually up to. And Job gets more and more frustrated. To the point where he, he wants this audience with God. And he questions God's ability to govern the world in justice. In justice. And then we have Elohim, he's a, a wise figure. And again, he offers some nuggets of wisdom and revelation, but, but again, he misses the point of what God is doing. And then in Job, in Job chapter 38, God speaks, and Job gets the audience that he wants. So I'm going to read Job chapter 38, uh, because it, it's, it's good to do that as a church, and hopefully there are some things that you can pick up, you can get a sense of what God is looking to do in his response by providing this tour of the heavens. So chapter, uh, verse 1 of 38, Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footing set? Or who laid its cornerstone? while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud wife waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place, that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their, their light, and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the sea? Have, you the gate, have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. Where, what is the way to the abode of light, and where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow, or seen the storehouses of the hail, which are reserved for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed, or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm, to water a land where no man lives, a desert with no one in it, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass. Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens? When the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen, can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons, or lead out the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with the flood of water? 
Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you, here we are? Who endowed the heart with wisdom or gave understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens when the dust becomes hard and the clods of earth stick together? Do you hunt the prey of the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in the thicket? Who provides food for the raven when it's young and cry out to God and wander about for a lack of food? And in the chapters, the immediate chapters that follow, God just continues this tour of creation. It covers some of the animals, the ostrich, uh, the hawk, a uh, donkey, a uh, horse, all to magnify his good creation. And in Job chapter 37, Elihu actually says, listen to this, Job, stop and consider God's wonders. Stop and consider God's wonders. Do we stop to consider God's wonders. And in these chapters, broadly speaking, we see a revelation of God's love, God's power, and God's justice. What God is looking to do through these passages, and we can look at them and think, actually, God, you're being a bit insensitive. You know, James is going through this all the time, and you're just you know, showing up or something. Um, surely you should put a hand around Job's shoulder and tell him everything's going to be okay. Um, you don't even answer any of his questions. But there is so much weighty wisdom behind what God is doing. He is seeking to enlarge Job's vision of God in order to inspire his faith. And as we'll see later on, that's what he does do. So we see a revelation of God's love in Highlighting different aspects of creation, he is making Job realise the intricate care and detail that God has put into all aspects of creation, from the stars in the space to uh, the, the sea life, to the, the, the bears, to the ostrich, everything. He's drawing attention to God, to, to his great handiwork, and saying, look, think about the care and attention I've put into this, the animal, the inanimate objects, the animal objects. And know that humans are my, the crown of my creation. How much more attention I've put into creating you. And how much more do I love you. See my creation here. See my love and intricacy here. And see that as but an echo of my love and care for you. David Atkinson in his commentary on this passage says this. It is by enjoying the Creator's handiwork, that we often begin to feel again the touch of the Creator's hand. It is by enjoying the Creator's handiwork, we often begin to feel again the touch of the Creator's hand. And Jesus builds upon this in the Sermon of the Mount. He's talking about this passage of worry. And worry he says, See how the flowers of the field grow, they do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon, in all his splendour, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? It's an echo of what God did with Job. He said, consider my creation here, consider my love here, and let it enlarge your view of how much I care for you. It's also a revelation of his power. In chapter 40, we get introduced to two rather strange figures. Uh, there's Leviathan, who's this mystical, dragon-like figure. It's also referenced in Isaiah 27. And the behemoth, which is plural for beasts. So we have here, um, so, so behemoth is probably like a, a conglomerate of different powerful animals. And the best way of looking at it is that together, Leviathan and Behemoth, they are the apex of natural and supernatural strength. And by making reference to them in these passages, God is saying, I am much more powerful than they are. I mean, these creatures are powerful, but they are nowhere near as powerful as I am. Chapter 40, verse 24, can anyone capture him, this Behemoth, by the eyes, or trap him and pierce his nose? Following verse, can you pull in the Leviathan and the fish hook? Now obviously Job can't do that, but God can. Yeah. So it's this wonderful revelation of his power. 
a power that extends to Job's life. That God is in control of his life, despite evidence to the contrary. And finally, it's a revelation of God's justice. Job chapter 40, verses 7 to 14. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? And can your voice thunder like his? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Unleash the fury of your wrath. Look at every proud man and bring him low. Look at every proud man and humble him. Crush the wicked where they stand. Bury them in all the dust together. Shroud their faces in the grave. Then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. So Job, earlier on, in chapter 21, he begins to question God's ability to govern the world in justice. And so God here is turning the tables on Job here. It's to great effect. And he's saying, okay, if you think you can set yourself above me in terms of the moral governance of the world, then are you in a position to bring justice on the proud from the wicked? Now obviously Job cannot do that. And it's firmly put him back, him back in his place. And this is reinforced with what else that we see in the passage. Because just as God is saying, is saying to Job, look, the natural order of things, just as you cannot understand, comprehend, or get your head around how I've created, how I govern, how I sustain the world, so you cannot understand how I govern the moral order of things. You can't understand that. But look at my creation. Look at its magnificence. Look at its magnitude. See my good character in that. See my ability to govern the, the, the magnitude, the wonder of this magnificent universe, and know that in the same way I am in control of the moral order of things, that I am a good and I am a just God. And so when you look at our creation, and you're just taken in by its beauty, think about God's goodness and justice and character that informed that creation. Now who here has seen Bruce Almighty? Yeah. It's a wonderful film um, about a TV presenter who is going through a difficult time, things are going wrong, and he begins to blame God for just everything that's going on. And so God, in the form of Morgan Freeman, comes and he basically says, okay, I will let you have God-like powers for a little bit. And he's like, great. And uh, he makes good use of it, doing all sorts. Um, but the most striking thing is when he gets, he gets all these voices in his head, as people pray. And he works out a system and goes, we'll get them on an email. And so he has all these prayers coming through, like a million and a half or something. And he's responding to them all individually. And he gets, finds it very boring and tedious. He's like, okay, yes to all. Because uh, the emails keep coming in, yes to all, yes to all. And he's like, brilliant, let's get on the rest of my day. But then chaos ensues, absolute chaos ensues. There's riots, no sports team wins, they're all draws because everyone's praying for their teams to win. Um, uh, there's so many lottery win winners that they all get like $17 each because they all wanted to win. It's absolute chaos. And quickly, uh, Bruce uh, realises that he cannot govern the world. He may think he can with time, but he cannot do it. It's, it's a lovely film, well worth watching if you've yet to see it. And we see that with, with, with what God is doing with, with Job. So it's like, try and put yourself in my position, see if you can do what I can do. And Job, as we will see, begins to realise, actually, I've, um, I've gone a little bit too far. During the, uh, the Blitz on London, the story is told of a vicar who um, is coming back from ministry to different people. And he's walking home and he, uh, he comes across another vicar. And he's exasperated and bewildered and he says to his fellow vicar, if, you know, I wish I was on the throne of the universe for just 10 years. And his colleague replies and says, if you were on the throne for 10 minutes, I wouldn't want to be in your world for 10 seconds. <laughs> I mean, it's like quite a come down. But there's a very profound point there. Yeah. Sometimes we can think that we 
do better than God. But God, what he's looking to do here with Job is saying, actually, do you realise? You, you don't want to be me. Given the, 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 the magnitude of what's involved in it, you're not positioned to be me. And then if we want to just see further revelation of God's love, power, and justice, at this passage, let's look at it through the lens of Jesus. Let's imagine you've got a canvas of the world, this huge canvas, and it's got the universe and everything. You wouldn't be able to see Earth. And yet, the creator of all of this took on the form of a human, a human, a servant, and came to that precious little dog which you cannot see to rescue a fallen humanity. A humanity that was turning in on itself, that was hurting it, that is hurting each other, and that is separated from God. This God came down to that little dot. What a revelation of his love that he would do that. What a revelation of his power, this God who could do anything that he wants, but decides to show power by being a servant. And a revelation of his justice. Because God needs to deal with sin. He's a holy God, he needs to deal with it. And in his justice, he has by giving himself. So that me, you, and the whole world can enjoy fellowship and oneness with him, this awesome God, creator of hundreds of billions, times hundreds of billions of stars. That is our God. That is our God. That is the revelation of God in the book of Job. And if I may just finish by looking at Job's response in Job chapter 42. Verse 1 to 6. And Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my counsel and knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I do not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust. Job was given a bigger vision of God, and it changed everything. And two specific things to draw from this. The first thing is that Job's questions lay unanswered but answered. The questions that Job had, they weren't answered at all. But having had this personal encounter with God, he did not need those questions to be answered because he'd come to trust in the mystery which was held by God. And so I don't know whether you have any questions at the moment for God. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't ask God questions. You totally should, and there's scriptural precedent for that. And sometimes, often, God does answer our questions, but often he doesn't. And he's saying, look, Come into the mystery and trust me. Trust in my power, trust in my love, trust in my justice. Have an encounter with me that knows that everything will be okay. That you can trust in me, enter into that mystery. That's why Job came, he had that personal encounter with him and he was able to trust and rest in him. He did not need his questions answered. And finally, Job's story shifted. The bulk of the book, he's with his friends, talking, lamenting, whatever it may be. And then he has this wonderful encounter with God, and then his story shifts. We're told that his life is, the second part of his life is better than the first part of his life. Now, I'm not saying here that the moment we come to that place of trust and we let go of our questions, that our life will be better than it has been before, that suddenly it all will go swimmingly well. But I do feel, having just wrestling with this passage, that God has wanted to say to some people here today that when you get to that point of trust and rest in Him, when you let go of those questions which you're finding difficult to, lay, to, 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 to let go of, or maybe just an aspect of control, when you let go and give it to God, He is waiting to pounce and move you on to the next point of your story. It's like a, a game of chess in some ways. It's like, I made my move, now it's your move. And your move, our move, is to 
to let go of those questions, to let go of control and say, God, I'm going to trust you in the mystery and just wait to see what God will then do in response to that. But he waits for you. Job was given a bigger vision of God and it changed everything. So, seek a bigger vision of God and let it bring you into a deeper place of trust in our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of Job. One that gets the heart of Satan. Whatever it is that you just have for us now, just settle it afresh on our heart. God. Help us to trust you in the mystery. Where we just need to let go of control, where we just need to let go of a few questions. Help us, God. But to do it so with expectation and faith. 